Chapters 9 and 10 Firing Day's Top Link and Final Day of Steam In 1966 I moved into the Top Link to become George Boone's regular fireman replacing Alan Gaff. George and I got along very well and as mentioned in the Drivers and Firemen chapter he was a great engineman and we had some excellent trips. George retired after a couple of months and Stan Harms replaced him in the Top Link to become my regular driver. Stan and I had a great time together on the footplate and he taught me a great deal about life in general. His wit and repartee were beyond compare and he always had an answer for everything. Stan performed his national service in the army and told amazing stories about his life whilst in uniform, although a lot of this time was spent in the glasshouse. If we spent any time together on a ballast train at night, we'd make ourselves comfortable in the guard's van and Stan would have you in fits of laughter telling you about his exploits. Stan was a confirmed bachelor and lived on his own in a bungalow at Tongham, and if asked where he would be spending his holidays, he'd say, I'm spending the next two weeks at Costa del Tongham. When we were on early turn, 0200 to 0600, I'd quite often collect Stan from his home on my motorcycle. I had a 350cc Triumph 21 then, and as crash helmets weren't compulsory in those days, he'd wear a sort of a Canadian-type bearskin hat with ear flaps to help keep out the cold. Stan was, let's say, on the large side, and to help keep his weight down, he'd quite often let me do the driving duties and he'd do the firing. One week, when we were booked the 0718am Waterloo to Salisbury turn, there was some sort of dispute at Salisbury, where the shunters were refusing to uncouple the locomotive from the train when we arrived. Stan was adamant it wasn't the fireman's duty to uncouple, so we just waited and waited and eventually someone else came to do it. The following day, Tim Crowley, our local traction inspector, was tasked to ride with us to Salisbury. This was to ensure that I uncoupled the train as there was such a delay the previous day. Although Tim was sympathetic to our cause, under protest it was decided that I had to get in between and uncouple. However, before the end of the week the dispute fizzled out and normal working resumed. Another time that Traction Inspector Tim Crowley rode with us was when we were working the 6.9pm from Waterloo to Woking. Our locomotive was a Battle of Britain class and when we were preparing the locomotive at Nine Elms, we were fortunate to find that after we'd been under the coal hopper, we had been given some hard black Yorkshire coal. The fire was rolling out the door when Tim stepped aboard at Waterloo, and on the way to Woking, the locomotive steamed so well I had to keep the firehole door open most of the time. The heat being generated by the Yorkshire coal was so great that the mac that Tim was wearing started to smoulder, and it was a wonder that he didn't burst into flames. Another one of the turns we had in the top link was to sign on and prepare our locomotive and then work a freight from Guildford Yard to Wokingham, calling in at North Camp and Blackwater on the way. Once the shunting work had been completed, we would then return light locomotive back to Guildford Motive Power Depot. On this particular day, Saturday the 21st of January 1967, our locomotive was BR Standard Class 3MT 77014 and our guard was Ray Ruffle. The locomotive that we had that day had arrived at Guildford Motor Power Depot in March 1966 from Scotland. She wasn't a particularly good locomotive, she leaked like a sieve and consequently wasn't free steaming. After we finished shunting at Wokingham, Ray Ruffer approached us and asked Stan if he would be kind enough to give him and his bike a lift to his home, which was situated near the railway line between Crowthorne and Sandhurst Halt. Stan was reluctant at first. He didn't particularly like other people being on the footplate, but agreed after Ray said he'd take a few photographs and supply us with copies, one of which is produced here. The strange thing is that it wasn't until 43 years later, when doing some research for this book, I was talking to Bernie Nibbs about the episode and found out that Ray Ruffle had completed a pencil sketch of 77014, plus Stan and myself, as we were taking water before departing from Guildford Motor Power Depot that very day. Bernie then showed me the frame drawing, which he had specially commissioned, which now hangs in his upstairs landing. What a coincidence!
This shows a copy of the original pencil drawing of BR Standard Class 3MT 77014 at Guildford Motor Power Depot on Saturday the 21st of January 1967. Stan Harms and, and myself are depicted taking water on the new pit. The other person in the drawing was shed labourer Frank Mitchell, shoveling ashes into the wagon provided. A huge training programme commenced with most Guildford drivers and past firemen learning the 1550 horsepower Crompton diesel electric locomotive and the sophisticated 1600-600 horsepower electro diesel locomotive. Considering that a lot of these drivers were over 60 years of age at the time and were only used to the basic controls of a regulator and brake handle of a steam locomotive, the majority of them adapted well, but there were exceptions and it wouldn't be fair to name them here. Some of the drivers would be completely paranoid about stopping the diesel engine or running out of fuel or water and when driving an electro diesel locomotive would utilise a 600 horsepower diesel engine for power all of the time instead of lowering the shoes to use the electric power. Needless to say some of the older drivers would let their firemen, later to be termed second men, work the train for fear of ridicule. These photographs show the two types of electro diesel locomotives. There were six prototypes, E6001 to E606, the JA type, and were originally built at Eastleigh in 1962 and were painted green. They were such a success a further 43 locomotives were built by English Electric at their Vulcan foundry with slight differences. These were painted blue and numbered E6007 to E6049. One morning, after we had returned from working a ballast train from Surbiton to Woking Down Yard, we had to move over a set of points to allow us to return light locomotive to Guildford. Stan decided to climb down off the steps of the locomotive whilst we were moving, and as we passed by the points, he jumped off and collided with the points handle. As the driving controls were on the other side of the locomotive, I was completely unaware of what had happened. But when I crossed the footplate to see if Stan had pulled the points, I noticed he was laying on the ground next to the points, writhing in agony. I got down to assist him, and after a while, Stan was able to get up, although he was still in considerable pain. He eventually managed to climb back onto the locomotive, but refused to go to the hospital when we returned to Guildford. The following night, we were booked together on another ballast turn, and to be honest, I didn't think he would come into work. He did, though but was unable to sit down at all and stood up all the time while we were on the locomotive. He told me that on examining his posterior, he found they had a bruise on his upper thigh the size of a saucer. He was extremely lucky that the damage wasn't even more extensive considering his weight. I did feel sorry for him as it must have been agonising and this continued for over a week. This photograph shows I've set the camera up on a tripod and it shows driver Stan Harms and myself at Guildford Cabin, circa April 1967. As you can see by the state of the table, cigarette ashtrays weren't the order of the day. Stan obviously had to learn the newer forms of traction himself, and whilst he was away on training courses, other drivers would take his place, usually past firemen. The Bournemouth electrification scheme was also in progress, and we would sometimes be booked to take ballast trains to and from the site of work usually somewhere between Farnborough and Basingstoke. Both of the through lines were blocked whilst the work took place and you often ended up in the middle of nowhere. This photograph shows U-Class 31639 with the material train country end of the down through line at Farnborough. Sometimes it would be necessary to get relief on site and the relieving crew would arrive by taxi in the early hours of the morning or by day they would be dropped off by a passing train. If you were lucky, you would also be able to catch the same train home. It was quite often the case when you would work a 12 or 13 hour shift, a lot of overtime was made in the months leading up to the end of steam. This photograph shows N-Class 31816, 
with a similar train at Farnborough. The crew on the locomotive, Terry Buckwell and Ray Woodford, issue instructions to Pat Kinsella's fireman, Jeff Summer, to hurry up and make a can of tea. During these times, both fast lines would be under engineers' occupation, and trains for Bournemouth would be diverted via Guildford and Havant, or via Alton and Winchester, over the Alps. I had some fantastic times with Tan as my regular driver, whether it was on the steam or with the later form of traction. His help and guidance helped to shape my railway career in the future. This thumbnail shows Stan in sombre mood, similar to the man in the Hamlet advert, in a photo booth having a self-portrait token for his ID card. And the following photograph shows the inside of a Christmas card that Stan sent to my wife Pauline and myself after he retired. The initials SJ equals Stanley John Harms. The final day of steam had arrived and I was booked on the alteration sheet 0800 as a standby for locos to Salisbury if required along with driver Doug Stent. It turned out there were four locomotives to leave the depot, two BR standard class 5 MTs, a rebuilt West Country class 34018 Ackminster and finally USA class 30072 which was to be the last locomotive to leave via Fratton with a Fratton crew. As it turned out Doug Stent swapped over with Bill Brain, who was to be my driver, and Pat Kinsella joined forces with Dave Alston. It was also decided that the two BR Standard Class 5MT locomotives would leave coupled together. Dave Bunce and Charlie Hampshire were to be the crew on 34018 and they would follow us to Salisbury. As we took water for the last time on the old pit, it felt quite strange that this was to be my final trip on a steam locomotive. Someone had placed quite a number of detonators on the line behind the tender of our locomotive and as we moved off to the coal stage to join the other locomotive, the detonators exploded continuously, creating a quite a firework display. The spectators on Farnham Road Bridge and the station must have thought it was the start of World War III. After coupling up with 73118, we made our way up the reception road and as I was on the leading engine, I climbed down to phone the signalman to let him know we were ready to depart. When the subsidiary signal cleared, we made our way up to Woking, both locomotives tend to first, and there were hundreds of people out there to either wave or take photographs. Away we went from Woking to Salisbury, people all along the line waving and shouting from every bridge we went under. Even passing through Brookwood, who would have believed that not many years before I'd been a young train spotter behind those railings? And here I was, a fireman on one of the last locomotives to leave Guildford on the final day. It was quite an emotional journey. As we approached greatly, the distance signal was at caution, and we came to a stand at the starting signal in the platform. The signalman said there would be a 15 minute wait for the preceding train to clear, and said we'd have time for refreshments. As it was a very hot day, it was unanimously decided to nip out to the pub adjacent to Greatly Station and bring the drinks back to the locomotives. Luckily I had my camera with me to record the event. Eventually, the starting signal cleared and we made our way to Salisbury Depot, leaving the locomotives for the last time before they were to be hauled away to the scrapyard at Barry a couple of months later. Sadly, an end to an era had passed, but I count myself extremely fortunate in being part of railway history. The next two photographs show rebuilt West Country Class 34018 departing Woking and then eventually running into Salisbury for the final time with driver David Bunce and past fireman Charlie Hampshire. In the meantime, back at Guildford, USA Class 30072 is preparing to leave for Salisbury and the next series of photographs record the event. Because of 30072's small coal and water capacity, 
it was decided to send the locomotive to Salisbury via a different route. First to Fratton to replenish coal and water, and then via Fareham, Netley, Southampton and Romsey, the locomotive being crewed by a pair of Fratton men. The late Dave Salmon took the next set of photographs, and it wasn't until Dave passed away and I became the custodian of his photos that we realised that he must have hung his West Ham scarf on the front of the smoke box for its final journey. That's just the sort of thing Dave would do. She then departed Guildford in a similar manner to my locomotive, with a line of detonators exploding under her wheels, and plumes of blue smoke can be seen as she heads for the tunnel portal. Luckily, 30072 was saved from the cutter's torch as she was purchased by Richard Greenwood the following month for the Keithley and Worth Valley Railway and transported from Salisbury by heavy road transport. Dave Salmon then had the good sense to take several photographs of the empty shed, the final one which brings memories flooding back. It shows the notice cases, a bike parked up in the corner and the stores hat, where as a fireman and cleaner, I'd stood at this hatch and asked the storesman to supply me with various things, oil and paraffin, cloths, tools, etc. One storesman also had the little sideline going, selling gents' toiletries, which he would offer you from a small brown suitcase. Something for the weekend, sir?